गिरिवार founder Acharya, his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Raj Granta Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Harinam Sankirtan ki jai. Nitai Gaur Premanande Hari. Glories to the assembled devotees. Glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Sri Guru and Sri Gauranga. Janaki Nath. Bring the bag. Aniruddha. I have something for you. Give me that bag. <coughs> There's two books in there. This is the book that was recently published as the position paper for Srila Prabhupada's position within this con. It's very, it's been a work that's been in progress for the last five years, and it was finally finished this year to explain Prabhupada's position and his relationship with the devotees in this con. Very scholarly. You read it? I read it, yeah. Oh. yeah. I didn't write it, no, I read it. <laughs> <laughs> I just read it. Ravinda Sarup Prabhu, he wrote it. Yeah. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo 
namo bhagavate vasudevaya Canto 10, chapter number 69, verses 7 and 8, Narada's visits to Krishna's palaces. Okay. So yesterday, I guess you did verses 1 through 6, and that was the beginning. Tasyam attam puram srimhad. Architam Sarvadishna Pai Hare Sakal Salam Yatra Tvastra Kritsnena Darshitam Can you hear me? It doesn't sound like there's much volume in this. <coughs> it's, it's clear? Can you hear me? No? Oh, so there's a few no's in the audience. It's a little more. How's that? That's yeah, better. Tasya mantam puram srimad. Tasya mantam puram srimad. Architam sarvadishna pai. Architam sarvadishna pai. Hare svakaushalam yatra. Hare Vastra karchyena darsitam Tasya mantam puram srimhahad Architam sarvadishna pai Hare svakausalam yatra Vastra karchyena darsitam Tatra soda sabi sadma Sahasrai sala angitlankritam Vishesha katam Vishesha katam hum saure Patninam babanam babanam mahat In that, Dwarka, <coughs> Antapuram, the private royal precinct, Srimat, 
Opulent. Opulent. Architam. 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 Worshipped. Worshipped. Sarva. Sarva. All. All. Vishya. Vishya. Of, the of the various planetary systems. Pai. Pai. By the maintainers. By the maintainers. Hare. Hare. Of Lord Hari. Lord Hari. Swa. Swa. His own. Gau Salam. Expertise. Yatra. Where? Twastra. By Twasta. Vishwakarma. The architect of heaven. Krishnanya. Completely. Darsitam. Shown. Tatra. There. Sodasabhi. With 16. Satma of residence, Sahasrai, thousands, Samalankritam, beautified, Vishesha, Nara, enter, Ekatmam, I'm sorry, Ekatamam, one of them, Sare, Lord Krishna's, Patninam, of the wives, wives. Bhavanam, palace, palace. Mahat, Mahat, great. great. Translation mm -hmm. purport by the disciples of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. In the city of Dwarka was a beautiful private quarter worshipped by the planetary rulers. This district, where the demigod <coughs> Vishwakarma had shown all his divine skill, was the residential area of Lord Hari, and thus it was gorgeously decorated by the 16,000 palaces of Lord Krishna's queens. Narada, ent Narada Muni entered one of these immense palaces. Purport is quite short, please listen up. Srila Jiva Goswami points out that Twasta, Vishwakarma manifested the expertise of the Supreme Lord, and thus he was able to build such exquisite, exquisite palaces. Srila Prabhupada writes, the great kings and princes of the world used to visit these palaces just to worship Lord Krishna. The architectural plans were made personally by Vishwakarma, the engineer of the demigods. And in the construction of the palaces, he exhibited all of his talents and ingenuity. Om Agyan Timiram Dasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stampitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadam Mayam Dadati Swam Dadati Kam Vande Ham Shigaro Shiyuta Padekamalam Shigurum Vaishnavam Scha Sri Rupam Sagujatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Padujana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Sha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagapate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Ahe Vrindavane Suri Vishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kampa Taru Vishcha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Paditanam Padre Pyo Vaishnave Pyo Namaho Nama Om Vishnu Padayam Krishna Presta Uttale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirusesa Sunyavadi Pasyatya De Satarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Hitikananda Sri Advaita Ganapar Sri Vasadi Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki so we're hearing about the architectural expertise that is quite unique, unique in the sense that it's never ever been duplicated. 
we can't even imagine what the palaces of Lord Krishna were like. It says they, there was no lights and so all the walls were inlaid with various types of gems. And just by the glowing of the gems, there was enough light to light up the palaces. And there was such rare uh, minerals and stones such as lapis lazuli and various types of red coral most precious and rarest of all stones constructed in the most amazing unique ways there was 16,108 palaces they want to build a building today it takes them years and it's just a piece of junk it's just glass and steel and they're so proud of it look what we built you can't see the sky, you just block the sky with this ugly thing. And it's just, you know, it's very dangerous to be in one of those buildings. <laughs> and they think, oh, just see our civilization. It's like an ant being proud of his anthill. It's so insignificant and so, what we say, lack of, uh, what's the word? finesse or cultural there's nothing there's nothing cultural about it it's just a dry old building and what do they use it for for sense gratification <laughs> and once in a while they build something a little fancier and then they think oh just see look what we've done it's more like I don't want to say this I don't know why it came to my mind it, it's called the Oedipus Complex. You know what the Oedipus Complex is? It's sex desire manifested in the form of architecture. So just use your imagination <coughs> and then I'll go on to another subject. So that's, that's what they think. I remember I was driving along one road in America. It was in the in a uh, place called Georgia. I was a place in Georgia, you know. Have you been to America? If you haven't, don't go. <laughs> if you have, just don't go back. <laughs> Unless you have to preach. They really need some preaching. <laughs> They're kind of desperate there. But I, there was one, I used to see it when I used to do Sankirtan, I would drive past there. And there was a, Georgia is known as the peach state. Peach state, you know, peaches? It's a nice fruit, really nice. So they made this gigantic peach out of steel, I think. And they, and they put it on the side of the road so when you, you know, all the highway people can <laughs> see it. And it was huge. It was at least like three stories high. And they think, oh, wow, is that so nice? Just a bit. And it didn't have any color to it either. It was kind of a peach that you wouldn't eat if you saw it. It looked it look quite juiceless. <laughs> uh, you know, and they think, oh, and they spend so much time and so much money and so much energy just to make these things that nobody cares about. I see Sivar Radha Lalitishwar Ki Jai. Chaganath Baladev Subhadra Maharani Gornitai Ki Jai. Well, here, what we're hearing about here is such amazing, we can't even imagine how gorgeous these palaces are. And 16,000 of them. And then they say, there was no civilization thousands of years ago. Now we've become civilized. And they refuse to believe the Shastras because they think the Shastras are just some mythology written by persons who want to eulogize the past and so, but actually, this that was real culture, and these palaces were built by the best of all architects, Vishwakarma, empowered to build these buildings. Well, how is he empowered? It mentions here, he was empowered by Krishna himself to do the work. Um, what did he produce? 
palaces were amazing. In fact, when Duryodhana came to one of these palaces, well, actually, Maya Donovan constructed this palace where it had a water around it, like a moat around the palace. And he made the water look like land and the land look like water just by his ability. Maya Donovan, he was also a great architect. He was a demon, though. He was the architect of the demons. He constructed the... What was that house, that famous house where they, where they did the Rajasuya sacrifice in, I think? What was that? There was another house where Arjuna burnt it down. You remember that story? It's in the, somewhere in the Bhagavatam. But he created this palace where the, the water around it looked like land, and the land looked like water. And so when Duryodhana wanted to come and speak to Krishna, he was coming into this palace and he thought the water was actually land and he fell right into the moat. <laughs> he was really humiliated. He was so angry that he turned around and didn't even go see the Lord. He actually came to give trouble to the Lord, so that was the plan, to give him some trouble before he got there. So um, this is uh, some type of optical illusion. So these these great personalities from the past had such abilities. Just like even nowadays we speak about demons. But look at the demons that Krishna killed. I mean, they had such mystic power. They could change their form into any form they wanted. It's the Putana witch. She was, by nature, quite ugly. But she changed her form in the most sensuous, voluptuous looking lady, that all the inhabitants of Vrindavan, when they saw her, they dropped what they were holding in their hand. Who is this beautiful lady? She must be Lakshmi herself. The goddess of fortune has come to bless our village. Therefore, they did nothing when she came in. They were just stunned by her beauty. And she just walked over to Krishna and she just asked permission if I could offer my breast milk to your little Lao, because uh, I heard about him and I want to offer some service. Everybody was so happy. Nobody could detect that she was actually a hideous looking demon. And then she went, and of course, the, only Krishna could see, of course. Krishna can see through all illusions. Krishna is the author of the illusion, so when he never gets illusion, but he appears to be illusion sometimes in order to make things exciting. Because in the past times of Krishna, he wants to make things exciting sometimes. So he always wins. So it's kind of not fair when you fight against him. Because he always wins. You just know the outcome ahead of time. So in order to make it a little exciting, you know, you can't sell tickets to a, a match, you know, when you know the winner's going to be the same every time. So he, he kind of makes it a little interesting. Just like when he was fighting with Varaha Dave, he kind of like, he dropped his club and it looked like he was being defeated. And the demigods got all kinds of nervous and started to pray to the Lord, don't fool around, we're, you know, our planets, every systems are in jeopardy. <laughs> they were all nervous. And the Lord saw, okay, time's up. And then he just slapped him and he was finished. <laughs> and then when he was playing with his friends in Vrindavan, this big, powerful, mystic demon. He was Agasura. And what a demon he was. He was actually a personality. His brother was Bakasura, his sister was Putna. He wanted to kill Krishna for many reasons, but one of the reasons why he killed his family members, because the first demon that Krishna killed was Putana. The second was Trinavarta. No, no, the first one was Sakatasura, the cart demon. Krishna was a little baby. He was sitting in a, underneath a cart full of pots and pans and utensils. But the, 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 the cart was not actually a, a cart. It was the demon who took the form of a cart. And Krishna could understand it. And so with his little tiny feet, they were so small, they were, and they were soft as butter. In fact, butter would be hard compared to his foot. He just touched the cart and the whole thing came crashing down and the demon died. <laughs> and when
when the when the inhabitants of Vrindavan asked, how did that big giant cart fall? The kids, little kids in Vrindavan, they saw Krishna kick the cart and they said, Krishna kicked it. And nobody believed them because they just, you know, little kids don't tell the truth sometimes, right? We mothers know that. <laughs> did you do it? No, he did it. <laughs> don't blame me. There's a story when two one one guy, one two little kids steal something from this one person, and so the guy catches both of them, and he says, "Did you steal it?" And he says, "I don't have it." And the other one says, "Do you have it?" I didn't steal it. <laughs> Smart. Kids are smart, you know, especially when they want to do mission. And Krishna empowers everybody to do something according to what they want to do. So little kids are empowered to do mission by Krishna. <laughs> it's called the mischief shakti, right? And they're really expert at it. <laughs> they can make mothers go nuts, right? <laughs> Those of you who have, <laughs> have kids. Fathers don't have to worry about it. They can just escape and leave it to the mothers. But Krishna used to do all kinds of mischief, but he would always do something beneficial in his mischief. And that was the thing about Krishna, it was always, his mischief always had a great outcome to it. So this big, huge demon, Agasura, he came and he decided to trick Krishna and the cowherd boys by lying on the path where they were playing nearby and open his mouth as wide as he could and it says that when he opened his mouth, his mouth was, what, eight miles high? That yeah, was really pretty high. Ever been in a plane? I'm sure many of you have been in airplanes. They don't even fly that high. We, folks, we're 35,000 feet. Dun, 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 dun. They're proud of it, you know, 35,000 feet. Look how high we're flying with this piece of junk, you know. <laughs> Everybody's inside suffering. Come on, we just want to land. Don't tell us about how high you're flying, you know. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> so, you know, and they're probably 35,000 feet and 29,500 feet is one mile. I learned that when I was in school. It's the only thing I remember about going to school was how, no, I learned two things. How high, how, how, what's the distance of a mile and what's the speed of light? It's the only thing, two things I remember after like 14 years of education. It's <laughs> useless going to school. <laughs> so, you know, so that's one, high, that's one mile high, a little bit there. So this demon was eight miles high from the bottom. And the kids, Krishna's friends, they were playing and then they saw, oh, look at this cave. We never saw this cave before. It's a new cave. Where did it come from? And the other kid said, no, it's not a cave, it's a demon. That's all right, don't worry, Krishna's here, let's go play. <laughs> so they ran into the mouth of this demon, one by one, and they were going in and playing and jumping. And, and Krishna somehow or other, his, his, his attention apparently got diverted away <laughs> from the play and he was doing something else. So when he turned around and he saw his friends heading into the mouth of this demon, and it says, this is interesting, Krishna became bewildered. It does, it says it in that point. And then why did he say that? Because he acted like he was bewildered. He was playing the part of an ordinary child. Just to make it more exciting. But there was another reason. You want to hear that reason? That one's for us. That reason is that why he did that was just to show you how powerful Maya is. Maya is powerful. And so sometimes we think, yeah, Maya can't touch me. You know? right. That means you're so closed by Maya, you can't even see that she's surrounded you. <laughs> That's what it really means. <laughs> So, yeah, it's like that. The more you think you're free from Maya, the, the more you're under the clutches of Maya. 
actually, yeah. Because those who actually think are free from Maya are praying, please. Prabhupada, there's a story where Prabhupada was in America and he was praying, my dear Lord, please don't allow me to fall into Maya. With sincerity and such, you know, what we say, heartfelt enthusiasm praying to the Lord just to teach us, of course. But he was also feeling like in the nature of a great soul, they always feel very low and very much covered by the material energy. They never think they're free from it. Because as soon as you think you're free from it, then the next minute Maya God grabs you, if you're not already grabbed. Because this, the illusion is that only by Krishna's mercy can you get out of the material energy, only by the mercy of the spiritual master. It's not what you're doing that's so important. It's by how much you can access that mercy to, to bring about you know, your release from the clutches of the material energy. Therefore, we always pray. Prayer is the most important part of our process of bhakti, to pray for the mercy, to pray to chant better, to pray to have better devotional relationships. Pray to improve the quality and devotion of our service. We're always praying. Pray not to get caught by Maya. Yeah. And the one who's always in that mood will always be in the best position. Constant prayer. Constant prayer. Not just prayer when, when things get difficult, but constant prayer. In fact, even when things are nice, apparently nice, then you should really pray. That means you're really in trouble. <laughs> because the niceties are just as dangerous as the so-called difficulties. So-called niceties like that. So Krishna acted bewildered. And says that, it, it, and that section is like, he didn't know what to do. <laughs> like he was like stuck. But then he thought, all right. But the demon, was waiting for Krishna to come into the mouth. Therefore, he didn't close his mouth until Krishna ran in. Krishna ran in, and then he closed his mouth. And then, then Krishna, Krishna, Krishna just gave him a sore throat. <laughs> gave him a, a fever first. <laughs> this, this fever went up pretty high. <laughs> Krishna just turned into this really hot thing, and it just you know, the demon was burning inside and then he couldn't li keep his life air and he just, his, his life air went out through the top of his head, went straight up in the sky and stood there. His life air, you could, those who had the eyes could see it. And then the demigods, when they saw that, they, they came out and did a big celebration dancing and chanting and Brahman came out and said what's going on what are you guys doing you know you're ruining my dramatic performance up here so he, he was thinking oh there's this, this little kid fooling around again so he went back inside he wasn't so interested and, and then Krishna stood there and that that uh, life fair which includes cases the soul <laughs> right into Krishna, and just merged into the body of the Lord. He got Sarupya Mukti. But actually, you know what it says in that purport? He got Sarupya Mukti. It says Sarupya Mukti by some of the Acharyas, but Jiva Goswami mentions he got Sarupya Mukti. He got Sarupya. And Sarupya Mukti is one of the forms of Mukti that is desirable. You get the same form as Krishna and you live somewhere on a planet in the, in the material world to associate with Krishna. That's how merciful Krishna was. Think about that. The demon comes, he's angry, he wants to kill not only Krishna, but Krishna's friends. And Krishna kills him and gives him, you know, a body like him, a body like him. <laughs> That's, so Krishna's very kind. But, it's, but to speak what he'll do for his devotees. You can imagine what he does for the demons, just how much he really protects and cares for his devotees. It's really what we say, indescribable. Can't describe it. That's his mercy. 
That's his love. And so he killed his demon. And then Brahma was looking. And that demon turned into a, like a little, it was like, it became a cave. And then later on, they kept the body of that demon there. And the kids used to play on it all the time. So Krishna provided a little opportunity for his friends to play. See, when the thing about Krishna consciousness, he, whatever you take shelter of Krishna, if it's difficult, he turns a difficulty into something advantageous. It becomes beneficial. Just like when we have our own struggles, and apparently some difficulty is there. By taking shelter of Krishna in the difficulty, not only do we get free from the difficulty, but we actually gain something, some spiritual merit, some spiritual advancement, some purification. So in any case, it's, it's always auspicious for a devotee when he takes shelter of Krishna, even in the most dangerous situations. That's Krishna's mercy. And so, um, these, and so Brahma, now Brahma, he's thinking, who's this kid? He's playing with cows, you know. So he decides to test Krishna. So Krishna's sitting on the bank of the river Jamuna, and it's lunchtime, and all his friends are there. You've probably seen that very beautiful Krishna picture where Krishna's sitting in the middle, and all his friends are around. It's almost like circles, and it just keeps going out and out and out like that. And they're all looking at him. They're all looking at him. And he's, you know, he's trading lunch with some of his friends. And they say, they look at his lunch bag and they say, Wow, what a muddy is so to make for you today, Krishna. Oh, that's so nice. Can I have some? And Krishna gives them some. And then he takes something from their lunch and they play like that. Prabhupada said one time, the perfection of life is to look into Krishna's lunch pail and see what Mother Yasoda made for him. <laughs> so, if you're wondering what the perfection of life is, <laughs> it's to see what Mother Yasoda made for Krishna. That's sweet, when you think about it. And it also gives a little indication of Prabhupada's connection with Krishna. He said that, it's really sweet. And so, and they were playing and playing, so this big demigod, you know, he's thinking, who's this little kid? killed this big demon. I'm going to test him. So somehow or other, the calves ran away. No, the cows ran away. The cows ran away. So Krishna said, oh, don't, you boys, you're, you're eating, you're so hungry, and there's so many nice foods. Don't stop. I'll get the cows. So he leaves. And then Brahma seeing Krishna's gone, he decides to play a trick on Krishna. So using his mystic power, he takes the boys and the calves that were still there, and he puts them into some slumber and brings them into his cave. And this goes on. Krishna comes back and realizes, oh no, here's this big demigod ruining my fun again. He's got nothing to do. I give him a big post. I give him secretaries. He's got the highest planet. He's got four heads. <laughs> and he's still, I mean, he's causing me some trouble. All right, I'm going to fix him, teach him a lesson. So Krishna manifests himself exactly. This is the most amazing thing about this pastor. Exactly. Like each boy with all their exact dress, their, all their facial and bodily features, all their idiosyncrasies, their characteristics, there wasn't a slightest bit of difference in those coward boys that Krishna manifested than the original ones. Everything was exactly the same. And he did that with the calves too. But the most amazing thing is that these calves and boys were not Krishna. So when they went home, the whole scene changed. Their mothers were seeing their kids, and they were feeling such love for their kids. Love like they had never felt before, and they were immediately attracted to embrace their children and show so much affection. Like they had, and they couldn't understand why. It's because it was actually Krishna in the form of their own child. 
And then there's this beautiful painting. It's in Bhaktivedanta Manor. You can see it in one room. It's in one of the. It's in the Brahmachari ashram in one room there, where the cows, they see their calves. The calves are a distance away. Now these calves were older calves, and these cows had other calves that were younger. They left their younger calves, and they were up on the hill, and their caretakers who were the cow herd boys and they just went charging towards their older calves like there was nothing else and the cow herd men were getting what's going on we never saw the cows act like this and they start running after the cows <laughs> and Balaram and Krishna are there and Balaram's thinking Krishna what's going on <laughs> and Krishna's just smiling <laughs> finally Balaram got it <laughs> But at first he couldn't figure it out. Because it says that Krishna is so powerful that he can even build, bewilder Balaram. And Balaram and Krishna are both the Supreme Personality of God. So there's an extra little Shakti there in Krishna. Because he's the original Supreme Lord. And uh, the cows, when they saw their older calves, they started giving milk to the older calves. And these older cows were taking the milk. And some of the cows were already dried up. And all of a sudden they had milk again. Because they had so much affection. Because the milk that the cow has is actually the affection for their calves. It's their love. The cow's milk is actually the love of the cow for the calf. Just like the mother's milk. When the mother has the baby, she shows her love by offering her breast milk to the child. That's an expression of her love. And it manifests automatically by the arrangement of nature. So the cows, and the, and the cow, her men were trying to pull the calves, the cows away from the calves. They couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. It was impossible. The cows had so much attachment to these older calves, like never before. And then Balaram's watching this whole thing, and he's thinking, if some mystic yogi has entered into Vrindavan is playing some kind of tricks. <laughs> what is it? And then he finally figures it out. Oh, it's Krishna. <laughs> He's doing the whole thing. And Krishna tells all the residents of Vrindavan, this is a good year for marriage. All the girls that are ready for marriage, even if they're not already, we'll just push them up a little bit. <laughs> and because he said, now we can get him married to the cowherd boys, which was him. Because <laughs> the, girl, the girls really wanted to marry him anyway. <laughs> but it wasn't possible, so he took the form of these, his friends, and they married Krishna in the form of these friends. So this went on for a whole year, by human land, earth calculations. By Brahma's calculation, it was a moment of time. So this is going on, and there's big marriages. Everybody, the Vrindavan's like it's never been before. It's the height of bhakti has reached there. And finally, you know, after a year, Brahma comes back just to see, to check it out. And he looks on the bank of the river, and the same scene is there. The cows are there, the, ca the cows are there, the calves are there, and Krishna's there, and he's eating his lunch. And he thinks, what's this? So he goes, runs back to his cave, where his these, where he took the original cowherd boys and calves, and they're there, still in a mystic slumber. He runs back, and he sees the same scene on the on the bank, and he goes. It says his four heads were like spinning. You know, <laughs> he must have had a headache after a while. Four headaches. <laughs> So it was going on like this. Finally, he runs back and he can't, he can't he can't figure it out. And then finally, what Krishna did really blew his mind. He turned everything, all the calves, all the cows, and all the residents of Vrindavan to four-handed Vishnu forms. And Brahma saw that. And then Brahma realized that you know I think I'm playing with fire here. <laughs> I made a mistake. So then he runs up to this little cowherd boy who's sitting on the bank, and he's just eating some yogurt with some rice, and it's dripping from his hand. 
and he with his foreheads and he just puts his foreheads crashing down with his huge helmets and all the cowherd boys are thinking where did this guy come from <laughs> and Christian knew all the whole scene and then he starts offering these beautiful prayers but I should mention one thing Brahma never stole the cowherd boys the calves and the cows because it says that there Krishna's eternal associates what he stole was a was a was a uh, a manifestation of their forms, which was the Maya forms of them. The whole scene was never disturbed by Brahma, but he apparently did. This is Krishna's bewilderment. <coughs> People think, well, I have so much intelligence, I have so much ability, I can do this. Uh, Krishna can bewilder anybody in a second. I mean, what is the most amazing bewilderment we see in this world, right? I don't want to say this because I'll probably get condemned, but I'll say it anyway because <laughs> I don't mind getting condemned. You know, you see two people walking along and they're both really ugly, right? And one's looking like the other, like it's the goddess of fortune. And she thinks he's like, you know, Ram. <laughs> oh, so. And they look at each other like, it's like there's nothing else. Everybody's looking. What the hell are they seeing in each other? <laughs> this is a good brahmachari class anyway. <laughs> and brahmacharinis can benefit also too. And everybody can benefit. You know, even, even householders can benefit. <laughs> and you so, you know, it, you know, it's just the illusionary energy makes something look different than it actually is. When Krishna was tricking Rukmini, making her feel like she had married the wrong person. She just fainted. And Krishna realized, I made a mistake. So he picked her up and apologized. Because Krishna was telling her, you made a mistake. You married me. You could have married Shishupal. He was more qualified. You don't even know my background. I don't have a job. <laughs> How can I make money? I can't. <laughs> Krishna was just like, you know, making it, and then she fainted, and then she woke up, and after Krishna realized, uh oh, I blew it, you know, because you know if she, he would have did it with Satya Bama, she would have really got angry. That was Krishna's program to get her angry, just to show her love for him, but she acted in the opposite way. She just fainted out of her heart was devastated. When she woke, fainted out of her heart was devastated. When she woke up, I mean, she said the most amazing thing. You want to hear it? I think a Ladini Shakti would like this one. <laughs> she said, "What man? What woman? Out of what woman in, in creation would accept? What woman in her right mind? That's better. Would accept a body that is covered with skin, and underneath there's bone and blood and pus and urine." stool and so many wonderful bad smells and decorated on the outside with mustaches and beards who would ex what woman in her right mind would accept that over you <coughs> kind of enthusiastic it's really a good class for the ladies <laughs> This is, that's reality. <laughs> that's just the reality. <laughs> and then Krishna kind of like didn't say anything after that. <laughs> he kind of agreed with her. So this is the illusionary energy. It can make something that is really not so nice look so wonderful. And it can make something that is really nice look the opposite. Right? So Maya is really strong. She can bewilder anybody anybody in fact as soon as you think I'm okay you're KO <laughs> I'm okay you're KO <laughs> so their devotion have the best and then the every case like that so so how did I get on to that where did I start with
Maya. Maya, Maya. Huh? Huh? Okay. The darshan, yeah. The beauty of the darshan. So, yeah, it's the devotee's devotion that makes Krishna come alive more and more. Krishna is always beautiful, but the devotion of the devotees pleases Krishna, and Krishna brings out his beauty even more and more. Like that. So, ultimately, here, yeah, so back to the text, and that is that what we have years ago, at least during the time of Krishna, and what we have now is like a disappointment compared. So, and it's a good, because here in London City we have so many big buildings. I mean, the, the architecture in London, some of the buildings are, are really quite nice. But now, nowadays, they don't build those old buildings anymore. These, some of these buildings are like a few hundred years old. Now they just build all the steel and glass, right? It's all it's just junk. Glass buildings are the worst. It's so ugly. It reminds me of a story about glass. Would you like to hear that? Glass story. Well, I'll tell you the last story. <coughs> Prabhupada was on a morning walk. This is a good message. You should, this is good for, is there anybody here who's very wealthy? No, okay. A wealthy brahmachari, so? <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada said, if you really want money, just go to the sannyasis. <laughs> he said that, he told the grihastas, go to the sannyasis if you need money. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. <laughs> he said that. Uh, anyway, he uh, this was morning walk, and there was this one big industrialist walking with Prabhupada. It was a, this was in India somewhere. I think it was in Bombay. So he's a nice man. He's walking on the morning walk with Prabhupada. So Prabhupada said, "What is your occupation?" The man says, "I make glass." Prabhupada says, "And where uh, where does glass come from?" What's the ingredients? Prabhupada man said, silicon. And then Prabhupada said, sand? And the man said, yes, that's correct. So where's the, sa uh, where's the sand coming from? And the man didn't say anything. Prabhupada said, it's coming from Krishna. Therefore, you're a thief. <laughs> Prabhupada called him a thief. The man said, but I do give donations. Prabhupada said, then you're, a, you're just a little thief. <laughs> I wasn't about to let him off the hook. <laughs> so everything belongs to Krishna. And if we give something back, we think, just see how much I donated. <laughs> that means we're reducing our thievery a little. That's all. The sentence is reduced somewhat. Still we're in jail. So, okay. So I think I should stop here. Any questions or comments? Architects, Maya, delusion. Yes, Ram Das Ji. Who? Jagat Balana Prabhu, he was here in your class. Oh. He says, he asked me. Is he laying down from a headache now? <laughs> Uh, he asked me if um, Vishwakarma who designed, mm -hmm. you know, his uh, buildings for the demigods, mm -hmm. whether um, he was an engineer or the architect. Was he an NGO? No, an engineer. <laughs> oh. Or an architect. An engineer. Or an architect. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada said engineers are sutras. Yeah, that's a sutra occupation. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was a, an engineer. He was an architect. He was a designer mm -hmm. who would design the buildings. Mm -hmm. and that means he was an artist. Yeah. yeah. The engineer just kind of takes the art and puts it together, makes it happen, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe 
he, he was a designer. He might have also facilitated the, the engineering process also. Because mm -hmm. he was a demigod and he was also he could probably do both. Yeah. But he designed it under it says here, yeah. In the construction of the palace he exhibited all the talents and ingenuity of Krishna. And Krishna empowered him to do that work, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was either both or just the designer, you know. But I was it seems like he was both. Right. He designed it and he made it happen also at the same time. Thank you. Is this person he's an engineer too? Is that the question? No. <laughs> no. Huh. He's a Pujari. Pujari. Yeah. He's kind of an engineer. <laughs> it's the engineer the puja. Any other questions? Everybody's so quiet. No questions. How to be protected from Maya? The question is how to get protection from Maya. Satatam kirtayantamam. That's the only protection. Satatam means always. Kirtam means kirtan. Always, one always, one who is always chanting my glories. Satatam kirtayam. So always chant the holy name. Always chant the glories of the Lord. And what is that verse from the the Vishnu Quran? It's a powerful verse. What is that? No, it's um, no. It's um, I'm trying to think of the English translation. I know them. I know it, but I'm just trying to get the right words. To forget the supreme personality of Godhead for one moment, that is the greatest illusion. That is the greatest anomaly. That is the greatest misfortune. Forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead for one moment is the greatest, it doesn't say great or, you know, it's a mistake. It says it's the greatest mistake, the greatest illusion, the greatest an anomaly is also in there. That means an anomaly is something that's out of sync, doesn't fit in. So we can tell how much are we remembering Krishna throughout the day? and how much we're actually thinking about. We're doing our service, and if we're absorbed in our service, that's as good as remembering Krishna. But devotees who take, who are really serious in the practice, even while they're doing their service, they want to remember Krishna somehow. They don't want to forget Krishna. And Prabhupada said, you should always be checking, am I remembering Krishna, or am I, what am I thinking? And if you're always remembering Krishna, you should know, Maya can't touch you. She can't, it's not possible. She might attempt it, but she, it's not possible to, to, to affect you in any way if you're remembering Krishna. Seriously remembering. So we chant the holy names, we take darshan. What is our, what's the purpose of our darshan? Many, but one of the purposes is to remember that throughout the day. So when you're out and doing your other activities, that picture, you can put it in your mind and you can just remember that same darshan you took that morning. So that way you're remembering Krishna. Jagadath, Baladev, Subhadra, Gornitai. So yeah, that's the only way. You have to remember Krishna 24 hours a day. There's no chance. Yeah. Yeah. How can police get married when they when they were sleeping somehow when Krishna appeared on them? And when they wake up, how they like feel that they are already married? You know that in the in oh, uh -huh. Very tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to go check with higher authorities. He had, the question was, 
they were s they were under mystic slumber, and then when Krishna took their forms, and therefore when everybody got married, they all married Krishna. Now Krishna's back, and they came back. So now they were married, right? So you might say, did they not know about the wedding? <laughs> It's not important. Obviously, in Vrindavan, there's one feature that is always there. And that is, whatever you want to remember, you remember. And whatever you have to forget, you'll forget. Because the energy is Purnamasi, she's Yoga Maya. So there's no Maya in Vrindavan. But forgetfulness, bewilderment, and the things that look like the material energy is simply Maya's play in order to enhance Krishna's pastimes. So Yoga Maya makes things interesting by acting in such a way as to cause bewilderment uh, and ordinary dealings, to, to spiritual dealings, to look like ordinary things. So when it comes right down to it, if the cowherd boys if Krishna wants them to remember, they'll remember. If Krishna wants them not to remember, they won't remember. So you can say there's no forgetfulness there. There's no ignorance there. There's no illusion there. Everything is perfect. So if the question is, did they remember they were married? If it's beneficial for their, if it's Krishna's will, yeah. If it's not, no. Because everything is going on according to Yoga Maya, which is working under Krishna's direction. Okay. And this, this is the world of remembrance and forgetfulness. So if we apply material logic to spiritual situations, it doesn't work. Just like, you know, it says, you know, well, when Krishna, when Balaram was transformed from the room of Rohini to the room of, room, room of Devaki to the room of, room of Rohini, you know, was there a seminal injection? You know, I see, and that's like a stupid question. <laughs> because, you know, in the spiritual world, or in, under the care of the, the spiritual energy, everything is happening by the yoga maya potency. But it's bewildering to us who are under the influence of material energy. That's why spiritual has to be explained by the acharyas. We have to read the scriptures. We have to hear from the great souls in order to understand the reality. And we can't, we can't figure it out. Because spirit is beyond our senses. It's beyond our mind. It's beyond our intelligence. It's even beyond our imagination. We can't even imagine what spirit is like. So all we can do is accept the authority of the great souls when it comes to trying to understand spirituality. Even in the smallest points like that. How is it Krishna bewildered? Brahma. When Brahma you know, is the most powerful living being in creation. He creates all the bodies of the living entities. But for, but if Krishna wants, he can do that. So I think the answer to your question is, if Krishna wanted them to remember, they would remember. If Krishna didn't, but it says, you know, everything went on as normal. So, obviously, when they came back, they knew they were married. Because that was Krishna's plan. He wanted to please the gopis. But now they were back and they were married to the cowherd boys. But ultimately, Krishna was their husband because they married Krishna. That's the best I can explain it. It's not so easy to explain spirituality. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, so thank you.
Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Lord Premanandi. Don't forget. Don't forget Krishna. Don't forget Prashada. Is that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> There's no other solution. No, and, and, that, and that another thing, never trust your mind. <coughs> Prabhupada says, never trust the mind. You think, I'm spiritually strong, I'll never fall into Maya. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> never trust the mind. If you always distrust your mind, then you're in a good position. That means you have to take shelter of Krishna, otherwise the mind will create the idea that, you know, it's okay. So, yeah. Therefore, Prabhupada says, conscious and cautious. Conscious of Krishna, cautious of not doing anything that will cause you to slip back into the material energy. So the devotee is very careful. Okay, that's maybe a more complete answer. You don't have to be fearful. If you're fearful, that's another form of maya. You should just know that you just practice remembering Krishna. That's it. Never put trust in your own abilities or your own successes, your own past, whatever have you done. Because life is moment to moment. You can be on the top of the world, the next minute you can be on the bottom. That's just the way this illusionary energy is, so powerful. So always put faith in Krishna, in the spiritual master, in the association of devotees, in the process, and not in your own abilities or your own experiences or talents. Because many devotees we have, so many devotees have many great, wonderful talents. But these things fall short of giving us the protection we need. It's only Krishna or the process of bhakti. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Thank you. His Holiness Chandramali Swami Maharaj Ki Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. A very nice class. Any question? Any uh, for the pleasure of the Lordships and uh, Srila Prabhupada and the devotees, we'll read out the scores from yesterday. On Sri Sri Radharanda Nishwara's Shankirtan party, four devotees went out and their scores were as follows. First one, Bhakta Vayu collected 32 Lakshmi points, distributing 10 medium books, four Mahabhik books for 13 book points. Oh. Anantanita Das collected 63 Lakshmi points, distributing 40 small books, 25 medium books, for 22.5 book points. <laughs> Bhakta Nikita collected 148 Lakshmi points, distributing 24 medium books, 25 Mahabhi books, for 62 book points. <laughs> Sundar Nitai Das collected 211 Lakshmi points, Distributing 56 Mahabhik books for 112 book points. And uh, total for the day, four devotees going out, collected 454 Lakshmi points, distributing 40 small books, 59 medium books, 85 Mahabhik books for a total of 209.5 book points. And then in uh, Radha's boutique shop upstairs, we uh, distributed 39 books and collected a total of 225 Lakshmi points. And then in, uh, yesterday in Transcendental Govinda's restaurant, we distributed prashadam to at least 271 customers. Wow. 